Dear Holy Father, we uh, thank you for this semester. I thank you for, again for these students, Lord, in this class. This opportunity we have just to uh, meet together and study your creation. Enjoy math. Uh, I just pray be with us today. Help us to, again, Lord, glorify you in what we do. And uh, just to bring things to a, to a good conclusion, Lord. In your name I pray. Amen. Okay, so um, <coughs> I had presented to you guys the Frobenius theorem, give or take. And um, so let's see here. We talked about distributions. We talked about annihilating one forms. Um, ultimately, we came to this uh, list of equivalent statements, which I think is useful to re reproduce again. Um, basically, here are the following are equivalent. Um, one, D is involutive on U subset of M. Now here, this D, um, D could be, um, is, is a uh, k-dimensional smooth distribution. Basically, what that means is that um, there exists, say, x1, x2, da -da -da, xk, um, smooth vector fields uh, to uh, locally locally span D um, over U. And that's called a, a, a generating frame. Um, that's, that's, that's one. Um, two, um, D omega one, D omega two, uh, da, 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 D omega n minus k annihilate D. Um, and um, these these are smooth um, defining forms for D, where D is the um, kernel omega. Uh, well, let's say D at the point Q is the kernel of omega, ah, curses, omega 1 at Q intersected with the intersected, not N. Talked about this before. Kernel of omega 2 at Q intersected with um, kernel of omega N minus K at the point Q. So it's the um, these these one forms <coughs> uh, one forms who 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 annihilate the given distribution pointwise. Um, so the condition of now you can talk about annihilating one forms independent of the condition of involutive. Like you just take a distribution; it doesn't have to be involutive, and you can still find defining one forms. It's just kind of like a dual description. Um, but the involutive condition is captured in the statement that the differentials of the defining one forms, um, the annihilating one forms, are also annihilators of the distribution. And then three, another way to capture this notion is that um, there exist smooth one forms alpha ij such that d omega i is equal to a sum um, j equals 1 to n minus k of omega upper j wedge alpha ij. So it's pretty obvious, right, from that formula. You can see why that formula would imply 2. That's pretty easy to understand. Why would two, 3 imply 2? Well, if you, if you feed d omega, you know, a tuple of, of vectors in the distribution, some of the vectors are going to be, um, you know, the one of the vector will be eaten by the, by the one form. I mean, a, a pair of vectors, really. This is a two form, right? 
So you give it a pair of vectors, then each term in here either has alpha ij acting on the vector or omega j acting on the vector. But if omega j acts on the vector, by definition, it's zero because the, 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 ve the one forms annihilate the distribution. So it's easy to understand this implies that. Um, going, f going from here to here is a little more subtle. I won't go over it. I maybe already did. I, I can't remember what I did last time, unfortunately. Um, if only I could like watch a video or something. Oh, well. Um, hey. Anyway, so th those are your, and these are all the Frobenius theorem, all right? So now, <coughs> a couple of things I want to show you. First of all, I will show you the example of Pfaff's theorem. Well, I, I, I debate. I debate. Let me start with Pfaff's, the Pfaff's theorem thing. That's e actually easier. So here's an application. All right, um, so here, first of all, definition. Uh, omega, a smooth one form on N. Um, then mu, a smooth function. On M, or it could be on a subset of M. It's called an integrating factor. If what? Mu omega is what? What's that? Exact, right. That's what it means for mu to be an integrating factor. All right, so a couple claims, which we'll prove. Uh, one, if you have a non-zero, uh, if, if omega is non-zero at p, for all p, um, then omega admits uh, integrating factor in neighborhood of each point um, eh, if and only if d omega wedge omega is equal to zero. First claim. Second claim, um, if the dimension of m is 2, then every non-vanishing one form admits an integrating factor in a neighborhood of each point. Okay, so let's look at one. So suppose what? Um, suppose it admits an integrating factor. If what? If d alpha is equal to mu omega, right? That's what, that's what it means to say that it admits an integrating factor. It means it's the derivative of some other form, right? Then what? Check it out. So what, what would d omega, wedge omega, what would that look like? I mean, we'd like to show that that's 0, given this condition. How do we do it? How to, how to show this? from that. I think Joe is right. I think we should differentiate it and see what we get. So let's see, that's, that's 0. On the other hand, that's d mu. 
which is a one form, right? Wedge, omega. Now mu is a function, so the Leibniz rule for, for differential forms, the product rule, just there's no, it's just plus this time, because that's a zero form, plus mu d omega, right? So then what? Mu d omega is equal to minus d mu wedge omega. But d omega is a two form, so I don't know that d omega wedge d omega is automatically zero. I get one form wedge one form is zero, but like two forms wedge two forms can be non-trivial. Wedge omega on both sides? Okay. What's that tell us? Uh, so this, if we have mu d omega wedge omega is equal to minus d mu wedge omega wedge omega. Now, 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 th now this is zero. That's a one. Uh, that's one form wedge one form being zeros. You could take it as part of the definition for the wedge product, really, and build it from there axiomatically. So what we have then is mu d omega wedge omega is equal to zero. What happens if m if the integrating factor is zero? Can that is that allowed? given the condition here. We're assuming that omega p is a non-zero, everywhere non-zero, one form. Yeah. So I don't, I don't think if, if we had mu was zero, I think that gets us into trouble with this here. Yeah. Well, I mean, anyway, it's clear that if we could argue that mu is non-zero, then we have it, right? Oh, I said if and only if, didn't I? How do we go the other direction? <laughs> I haven't worked that out. Oh, no. <laughs> I just erased one of the apps. Let's just try it. Let's see what happens. Who knows? Maybe we can do it. Because I have more confidence in your ability to figure stuff out. So what are we assuming? Suppose d omega wedge omega is equal to zero. <laughs> what do I want to prove? Yeah, I mean, I, I want to prove that omega is equal to uh, what? Well, I w yeah, yeah, we want to prove that, um, yeah, it's exact. We want to prove that there exists an alpha such that what? It's mu, mu omega for some, for some mu. The what? Hmm. I don't know, right off. Um. You guys have any ideas? No? 
I mean, my suspicion is um, well, if I can show, eh, I say this. Hmm. There may be a way to use Poncrase. I mean, we, if we can, if you can use Poncrase lemma here, right? That's sometimes helpful. If we can show it's closed, that implies it's exact. Supposing that we're, I guess we haven't exposed such a thing, but I think that's that may be in the in the in the works here. All right, I'm, I'm going to go on. I have a lot of things to say today, so I'll just leave this as an exercise for your reader. If omega is different than zero, I wouldn't have to do the omega. Uh, that's not a bad idea. So if omega is equal to, say, a, well, it's, a, it's an n form, ah, curses. So it's got a lot of components, right? I mean, like it's uh, a1 dx1 plus a2 dx2 plus a n dxn, right? Something like that locally. And not all of these can be zero. And then the, the, the hassle is that d omega is, you know, like a1 2 dx1 wedge dx2, maybe I should say b, um, dx1 wedge you know, dx2 plus b13 dx1 wedge dx3 and you know, so forth, <laughs> b, b n, n minus 1 n dx n minus 1 wedge dx n, uh, just jumping ahead a bit. And um, of course these a's and b12's are related in a systematic way, right? Um, so that that wedge being zero implies a um, bunch of differential equations between these a's and b's. Oh. I mean, yeah, omega is not zero, but that just gives me that at least one of the components is not zero. I mean, if I knew all the components were non-zero, that might get me to something faster. This is probably not hard. I just I I, I must go on. Um, okay, but but two is actually very easy. Sorry, I, I should have recognized I ignored the if and only if in my, when I was writing my notes. <laughs> I did the easy direction. <laughs> Good job. Okay. Um, <laughs> okay, if m equals 2, every non-vanishing one form admits an integrating factor locally, right? So suppose n, n equals to 2, every non, all right, so like a non-vanishing one form would be something like m dx plus n dy, right? So it's saying that there exists, we can write this as like I m dx plus I n dy is equal to the differential of some, some, some zero form f. Why, why is that if, if, this is, if this is omega, which is it's just not identically zero? In other words, either m or or n is is non-zero at each point, right? That's what I need. And let's just take m equal to r two for the sake of being boring. You use one, right? So we have non-zero. One form, if only if d omega wedge omega, right? <laughs> so, what's d, d omega? Let's just do some counting. D omega wedge omega, two form, one form. It's zero by dimensionality. <laughs> this is two dimensions. You can't. Uh, the only three form in R two is zero. And this is Hopf's theorem. That any differential equation. Um, you know, given this condition. I think we also need that M and N are smooth. You probably can weaken that a bit, but um, Pfaff's theorem states that any differential equation, if I have M dx plus N dy, right, I can find some integrating factor I, so it's when I multiply it, it becomes an exact equation. And then the solutions are just level curves to F. Well, that's not true. 
Well, in Rn, this is true. There is a, there's a, I mean, Pfaff's theorem, theory, it, 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 there's a Pfaff's theory in Rn, it's just it's not as nice. nice, yeah. Although I think it's, I think, I think I wouldn't be wrong to still say that it's nice. It's just not stupidly easy as dim <laughs> dimension counting like this. Okay, so here's an example um, that I should show you. Now, um, uh oh. So I've been, I've been thinking some about this. I've been trying to understand, you know, Frobenius theorem, sort of trying to gain more intuition for it, thinking about it a lot the last few days. And um, it seems to me that if you're willing to sort of just set aside some picky analytical details, it's very natural. And um, let me try to explain what I mean by that. And the, 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 um, hmm? what? Oh, where's my white shirt? Oh, I don't know. Yeah, I don't know where the white shirt is at the moment. You guys are just, you guys are distracting me. All right, so. It used to be a white shirt. Now it's kind of that Um, so to first, first of all, I mean, the question is, given, given, distri given distribution, you know, um, D subset, basically it's a subset of the, of the tangent bundle, right? So this is, this is essentially locally, you're, you're given a bunch of vector fields, K of them, right? And then the question is, are there integral, and the thing I have left out of that description, unfortunately, is the thing we talked about more last time, the leaves of the foliation, right? There are these integral submanifolds or integral manifolds which line up um, with the vector field. Now, in the case that k is equal to 1, this is very simple. You've got you know, a vector field. And we might even talk about this in differential equations, right? What are the integral, th the, integral the, the, sub you know, the integral manifolds are actually integral curves. They're the solutions that line up with, with, the, with the distribution, right? Um, k equals 2, then you've got, you know, at each point you're, you know, you're attaching two vectors, right? But, <clears throat> so you've got, you know, maybe a vector field x and a vector field y, but <clears throat> If you just think about a specific point, and I'm trying to draw three dimensions here, believe it or not. Um, you know, if you just think about a particular point and you think about, well, how am I going to, you know, what, what, is the, what does the leaf and the foliation look like there? You know, what, what is the submanifold which fits to this distribution? And, and that means that it, it takes the, you know, the vectors x and y at the point as tangent vectors, right? So you can just kind of think about it like, oh, I'm just going to basically think about the integral curves of x and y through that point, and then that just kind of will, and I do the same thing here, right? And then if I can somehow kind of sort of fit these together, then all of a sudden, you know, I've got some kind of two-dimensional surface, which at each point along the surface lines up with this distribution, right? So essentially, the way to build the surface, we can build the surface from You know, build the leaf from the flows of x and y. Or if you had a three, if you had three, you you could you would have three integral curves to work with. You could build a three-dimensional um, integral manifold. Now, so here's an example that actually fleshes that out. In particular, um, a vector field x equals to x partial partial x plus partial partial y um, plus x times y plus 1 partial partial z and y equal to partial partial x 
plus y partial partial z. All right. Now, I'll skip over the details, but we can calculate. And I think you can do this. If you calculate the bracket of these two, like we talked about last time, um, it works out to minus partial partial x minus y partial partial z. But you're like, wait a minute. That's exactly y again. So it's minus y. OK, so if, if these two define a distribution d, this says that d is involutive. All right? Now, <coughs> now I'm, I'm following um, Lee's Smooth Manifolds book. We're now going to see how to find a flat chart at the origin, all right? Um, his, his idea basically is, OK, so we z is ugly. Maybe we can use x and y. Well, you've got partial partial x sitting alone here. You've got partial partial y sitting alone there. It seems reasonable to hope that maybe x and y we can use as, as parameters for the leaf and the foliation we're looking for. All right, so what we're going to do is we're going to consider Project, usual projection, x, y, z projects to x, y. And so then the differential of pi at the point x, y, z, well, at the, at the d of x, y, z um, will be a mapping from the distribution at the point x, y, z to the tangent space at x, y of R2. OK, so he says, um, you know, and what he wants to do is he wants to find, he wants to basically say, OK, d is, d is basically the span of x and y, right? But x and y are ugly. They're commutators non-zero, right? That means that you can't identify them directly as, the, as the, the being the derivations of coordinates. Like partial partial x and partial partial y are very special in and of themselves because their commutator is zero. So if you have coordinate derivations, you have to have zero commutator. So the first step in finding like local coordinates which like nicely match the leaf is to find a set of vector fields which re re reproduce the distribution but have zero commutator. So like what you want to do is you want to find another vector field um, v and w such that the commutator of v and w is 0. All right. Now, turns out, yeah, where can I write? Little calculation shows that you can use v equals to partial partial x um, plus y partial partial z and w equals to um, partial partial y plus x partial partial z. Now, these, by the way, I mean, one of these is already just y again. And the other one is actually nothing more than x minus xy. Now, I think he, he advocates a slightly more general procedure for finding these, but that's kind of like, you know, not too relevant to us this semester. You might wonder, like, what's the general procedure for finding these new vector fields, right? But at the moment, let's just content ourselves with checking that it works. So if you, if you take the vector, if you take VW and you take the bracket, you've got, uh, you've got Y comma X minus XY, like so. And so the bracket is, is linear, I mean bilinear rec rather. So this is x, this is y x um, minus y with x y. And then 
So this, the bracket of yx, if you believe this is true, then you should also believe that that's equal to y because the bracket is skew symmetric, so this bracket gives you y. And there is, let's see here, this I guess I just have to calculate. Um, how would you calculate this? Yeah, so I have what? I've got y, x, y, right? So let me feed it a function. So this would be y of x times y f minus x y um, of y f. And how's that work out? Well, this, I, I have a, I mean, y is a derivation, right? So it, what it does is it goes, okay, so that's y acting on x um, times y f um, plus x times y of y f minus x times y y f. These guys cancel, right? And this we can calculate. What is y acting on the coordinate function x? Right, so if you feed, if you just plug in, plug in x into this, we get zero and we get one. And so what do you get? One times yf. So therefore, the bracket of y and x times the, the vector field y is again just y. And so we get y minus y also known as zero. So <clears throat> the idea then is to use the flow. So like basically the x and the y we could think of perhaps as being, they, maybe they're like tilted or something nasty, but I, I don't know, it's, it's hard to visualize exactly what it means for, well, it actually isn't hard to visualize. What it means is if you flow, I mean, if you have vector fields whose commutator is non-zero, if you flow along, along one and then flow along the other, and if you flow along the other and then flow along the one, those two different paths differ, and they differ by a term corresponding to the commutator. So that when the commutator is zero, those two different flow patterns converge to a single point, and, and that's, that's, that's the beauty. Now, So, all right, so what do we want? We want to find the integral curves of v and w. How do we do that? So integral curve of v would be like v gamma equals d gamma d, dt, right? And so what's that tell us? In other words, um, partial partial x plus y partial partial z is equal to x dot partial partial x, right? plus y dot partial partial y, plus z dot partial partial z. I'm abusing the notation, using x, y, and z for the, the x, y, and z components of the curve again. And so we face a system of differential equations again. This is x dot equals to one, y dot equals to zero, and z dot equals to y. So you can solve these. Even if you haven't had differential equations, you can solve these. This is x is equal to t plus x naught, um, y is equal to y naught, I mean y naught, and z is equal to y naught t plus z naught. <coughs> okay, so this leads us to the following flow. The flow at time t um, through the point x, y, z is just x plus t y, z plus t, y. So that's the flow along, along gamma, I mean along v. Likewise for w, let's say w alpha equals to d alpha dt. This gives me, I'll jump straight to the equations. It gives me x dot equals to zero, y dot is equal to one, z dot is equal to x, and so these lead us to x equals to x naught, y equals to 
um, t plus y naught, and z is equal to um, x naught t plus z naught. These give us the following flow. The flow along w is, we could say, alpha sub, uh, alpha sub t, I suppose, of x, y, z, through the, the, the flow through the point x, y, z is given by x plus t, oh, sorry, x comma t plus y comma x t plus z. All right. Now the idea then is to parameterize, um, well, how, let's see here. Why do I have a third? I am confused. I have, a, I have an extra letter. I don't know why I have it there. I know what I want to do is to look at the flow. Now, I shouldn't use, maybe I shouldn't use T. Well, I use T for both, but now here's the idea. Um, we're at the point, I guess we're, we're in, where, where are we? We're in R3, right? So we're at the point 0, 0, 0. And I want to try to find like the the curve that sort of goes through through v. I mean, I want to find the integral, um, the integral surface through through the origin using these flows, right? So, um, sorry, there's a, there's a W that's bothering me. No, oh. this made sense when I wrote it. Try to let me just write it down, and maybe you guys can explain. So he has phi of u v w is equal to gamma u. Hmm. Composed with alpha the. I mean, he doesn't actually have this. I've changed his letters a bit, but anyway, just in case you look at the book. Zero zero. W. I mean, th this is a definition for phi, all right? Saying build this function phi of u, v, and w by flowing along the um, integral curve for the vector field v and the integral field for the vector field w, you know, subsequently. Uh, well, which one first? I guess first we go along W, and then we go along V, right? But we're starting where? I guess that's the point. This is just a starting point. It's just saying do this in the Z equals W, if you like. I mean, it's basically just saying we're going to do this at not, not zero, 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 but zero, zero, W, really. I, I think that's all this is. That W is bothering me, though. Okay, anyway, so... Then what do we have? We've got gamma u. What's what's alpha v of zero zero w? Zero zero. So put zero zero w and put this equal to v. What do you get? Zero, comma. Just but t is is v. W, yeah. So we get zero V W. And then what's gamma U? So we worked it out over here, right? The flow. I guess we let me just put it let me do a cheat here. U comma what is it? Zero? No. 
<laughs> yeah, zero VW. OK. So we have a u here. x was 0, y was v, v was w. All right, so there it is. So this is u comma v comma w plus uv. Now you can invert this. And if you invert, you get uvw equals to phi inverse of xyz, which let's say is equal to x comma y comma z minus xy. So in other words, this, this thing right here, this leaf that we just found, is really just, what is it? It's, it's a level set of w of x, y, z equal to y equal to z minus x, y. That's, that's the leaf. Now, if you can shake loose my confusion today, right, you should see what we're doing is very geometric, right? We're just taking one, inter one vector field distribution, another vector, vector field distribution, following one a little bit, following one another a little bit, and then using those to build a patch on the leaf to understand it. I mean, that's, that's now we can go back the other direction, though, and we can try to understand this in terms of like annihilating forms. So if, if, um, if we're looking at a, a two-dimensional distribution, right, k equals two, on, in our three, how many, how many, how many uh, defining one forms do we need? Just one, right? And what is our defining one form in this case? So let's say d is the kernel of omega, where omega is equal to what? Hint, this is the leaf. I submit to you it's dz minus y dx minus x dy. Now, try it out. Is omega, am I right? Omega of x, what's that equal to? dz minus y dx minus x dy. Feed that thing x, which was x partial partial x plus partial partial y plus x times y plus 1, partial partial z. Remember that this, these functions just pull out, right? So basically, this just is a dot product. It's a fancy way of writing dot product. So like dy with dy gives us one thing. dx with partial x gives me another thing, right? So let's see here, 1, 2, and then dz with this one gives me 3. So 1 gives me minus x. And then 2, oh, sorry, yeah, 1 gives me minus x. 2 gives me what? Minus xy. I thought that too for a second, but look at it. Right? 2 is up here. Let me do it in a different color.
I mean, I can do D, I mean, I could do the DXs first if that would be here. There, better? Okay, and then um, the Z with Z is plus X times Y plus one. As you can see, you get minus X plus XY minus XY. I mean, it's all zero. And so, I mean, I, I think this, this idea of following the flows is very, very geometric, right? But if I was just after, if I was just after what is the level surface for the leaf, I think it's probably calculationally easier just to kind of stare at these for a while and try to figure out what is the perp to this, right? And once you know the perp, then you can find the dual form pretty, pretty easily. Um, okay, so. <clears throat> See, because um, if you were to write down, what, what's, what's the what's the perp here? Deperp, if we use vector fields, would just be what? It would just be the span of like partial z minus y partial x minus x partial y. Now, I just figured that out by looking at my answer, but my point is you could also figure this out by just kind of like usual perpendicular calculation kind of thing. And once you found that, once you know that this is the perp, then it's easy to write down the corresponding dual form. All right. You can also show that d omega of, of y is equal to zero. That gives you y minus y is zero. That's it's easier. Es bueno. All right. Now, I would also say this. Um, you know, there's an interesting theorem at the uh, at the end of you know in the, in the appendix in Rentlin, where he talks about like what's the significance of the bracket not closing, and if you understand this example we just do we just did, think about what it would mean then if you had a three-dimensional space and you had two linearly independent vector fields, right, and their bracket doesn't if it's not involutive, right, that means the bracket goes out, it has to be the, in the third direction that you're missing, right? And so if you throw in that as a possible thing you can build integral curves from, all of a sudden you're not building a leaf, you're building a three-dimensional thing. In other words, you're back to the whole space again. And if you start studying motions which are built from vector fields, it then follows if you have a set of vector fields which is sort of, you know, it's not involutive, right? <coughs> then if you have enough of them, uh, you know, unless you could somehow close it before you get to the whole space. But suppose you can't do that. I suppose that it's sort of maximally involutive, so that when you look at the <coughs> look at the set of vector fields and it, and, it, and the brackets, you get say n dimensions in an n-dimensional context. Then that set of that that kind of distribution, the motions corresponding to it, motions in the sense of following the vector fields flows like we did today, then the motions will cover the whole possible space. And he gives a really interesting example in terms of a, a, a wheel rolling without slipping, right? He, he shows that if you study the five-dimensional space corresponding to like the position of the, of the, of the uh, what is it, quarter or whatever it is, disc, on the plane corresponding to the angle that it's, it's, it's tilted at and the angle with which it's spun, then <coughs> because the, the vector fields which correspond to that motion um, their, their, you know, their bracket is, is not involutive. That corresponds to the fact that you can hit any possible combination of the angles and the position of that, of that thing rolling in the plane. So you can see how understanding that example would lead you to something quantitative you could say about, say, like robot arms and stuff. If you could imagine, you know, um, parametrizing, pu putting coordinates on a robot arm and looking at the vector fields which correspond to its motion if you can show that those vector fields don't close back in, if they're not involutive, if they're, if they're sort of maximally non-involutive, then that means that you can make contact with any set, any possible um, value for the parameters. It's, it's very, very interesting. The name of that theorem is, uh, is it? I probably can't say these names. <laughs> I'm referring to Appendix F in Renthlin. The Chow, Chow, Resh, uh, Resh, Resh, 
Reshevsky. I don't. I don't I'm, 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 that's not. That's not my thing. Uh, it says this: if 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 delta is a bracket generating distribution on a connected manifold M, then given any two points of M, they can be connected by a path whose tangent vectors lie in the distribution. Right? These curves are built from paths whose tangent vectors lie in the distribution. That's what a flow is. It's a very, very interesting idea. I, I'd like to flesh, flesh this out more for a lower level course. I think it's, it's very interesting. Um, <coughs> another example then that's a little bit easier. So the examples which are just built from um, toying around with uh, differentials are easier. I like this. I think this is a great example. I'm very happy with it. And I have a bunch more of those I could show you. I probably shouldn't. Ah, what am I doing? Yeah, where's my shirt? That's a good point. You guys have asked an important question. Where did I put that shirt? I wear it on the weekend. <laughs> silly, silly people, I wear this shirt on the weekend. Lorenzo can't prove otherwise. I'm pretty sure you didn't get a picture. <laughs> All we can be sure is that I was wearing a coat. <gasps> oh no! Ah! How dare you? <laughs> um, so here's an example. Theta 2xy plus z squared dx plus x squared dy um, plus 2xz dz. What's that? What if I had a ponytail? I mean, that's not something I eat. D theta. Uh, 2x dy wedge dx minus 2x dx wedge dy um, plus 2z dz wedge dx plus 2z dx wedge dz. As you can see, What? <laughs> ah. You don't even like a blue shirt underneath. It was a red shirt. It was a blue shirt? No. no. It was right. a red white shirt. It was a red one. It was a red one. Ah. 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 Curses. Our clothes on the line is like these red and black. Oh, that's my church shirt. I wear that every week to church. It's here. Of course you do. Find me wearing a different thing at church. <laughs> it's actually true. <laughs> <laughs> no, that that wasn't that wasn't actually that wasn't that wasn't actually my thinking. It, it really is. I, if I have to credit anyone, it, it's my my quantum field theory professor. He always wore white, and I just thought that's an awesome idea. I couldn't commit. I couldn't commit to the all white. He he wears sweatpants. Or sweatshorts, or a sweatshirt of the appropriate length for the weather, always white. You can find pictures of him in grad school wearing white. It's it's serious. Like you cannot find. I mean, there is no picture of him without it, as far as I've ever seen. It's it's really phenomenal. Anyways, <clears throat> so this is equal to zero. Oh, so you, you can prove that theta is equal to then, theta is equal to df, and um, <clears throat> so the, fa the fact that d theta is equal to zero means what? I mean, so theta is like the, um, ah, this, this sort of, theta is playing the role of omega, let's say omega one, 
and the fact that it's zero gives you that there exists, <laughs> it's completely integral. And in fact, theta is equal to df, where f is what? x squared y plus xc squared. I think you guys could come up with that if I give you three more seconds, um, right? So, oh, I feel a little bit lightheaded. I'm going to stop there for that. Oh, man. What's that? Uh, well, that, that won't happen if the d theta is equal to zero or more. Um, so more generally, we have what? We've got, um, what is it? Uh, da, 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 da. Basically, so for this, um, for just one, if there's just one one form, right? How does this theorem, how does the Frobenius theorem in differential form sort of truncate when there's just one one form? It becomes what? I mean, this translates to what? It translates to just d, d theta is equal to what? Something like theta wedge alpha or something like that, yeah. All right, so um, in other words, if, 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 if d theta is not equal to 0, then that implies that theta is not equal to df, right? But if, if d theta is proportional to, if well, do you, approximately theta, what do I mean by that? I don't know what that means, but I mean, we, we can't look for this, but I'm sorry, these, these notes are missing something, and, and, and so we, we look, go looking for that. Anyway, here's the, here's the theorem that I was trying to, trying to communicate badly. Um, Basically, if you have a Fafian system in some neighborhood and you have a differential ideal, there exist these m squared functions, gij, and m function fj, such that what? Such that theta i is equal to a sum j equals 1 to m of g i j df dfj. So th this is, and, and I'm not communicating it worth anything. This is another version of the Frobenius theorem, basically saying that um, I, I need the I need that it's a Fafian. This to say it's a Fafian system, I think, is to say that um, what was it to say? So I've got like three sets of notes here. I'm foolishly trying to transition between um, to say it's a Fafian system. It just means that you've got these one forms: theta one, theta two, theta dot, theta m. Um, so theta 1, theta m, Sfafian system. Um, and I'm, I'm also assuming that these are also the defining, the defining one forms for some distribution, all right? So we're, again, talking about Frobenius theorem. Then, um, and, and, and to say that the Fafians, I mean, to say, suppose linear independence is to suppose that the wedge product, theta 1, wedge theta 2, wedge da da da, wedge theta m, Not equal to zero. That that gives us linear independence of the forms. This m here is equal to n minus k in our previous verbiage. Um, anyway, so um, to say that you know these this that to, to say that d omega say d omega. So this would translate into of course d theta. Just basically set this omega equal to theta, right? Okay. Like that. I mean, 